Today I'm speaking to David Nichols. Dave is a professor at the Auckland University of Technology, the founder of the Critical Physiotherapy Network, the Physiotherapy History Association, and a co-founder of the Environmental Physiotherapy Association. In addition to these organizations, Dave is also a prolific writer, putting out academic peer-reviewed papers, blog posts, keynote presentations, and book chapters. I've been wanting to talk to Dave for a while about how he manages to sustain this level of creative and insightful output. I wanted to get a sense of how Dave thinks about workflow and to get some insight into some of the practical techniques that he uses to stay on top of all the projects that he's involved in. I hope that you enjoy the conversation. So, um, as I was saying a little bit uh, earlier, the, the whole point of the channel is to try and capture some of the ways that I think about being an academic, doing academic work, uh, putting into operational terms the kinds of things that people just expect you to do on a daily basis without any real guidance or, or background. And and one of the big things that um, I think a lot about is workflow. And by workflow, I just to, to put it concisely, I think about how do we capture how do we decide what information out there in the world is useful for the kinds of things that we want to do? How do we filter that information um, into our kind of immediate sphere? How do we capture it? How do we make sense of it? And then how do we push it back out in a different format uh, into something that's going to be um, hopefully useful for someone else? So, you know, in those, that's kind of is a very brief um, uh, just summary of what I've been spending a lot of time thinking about. And as I have these conversations with colleagues, I feel like they, a lot of people don't even recognize that this is a problem. Um, you know, they're kind of reacting to the constant barrage of emails. And as, a de as an academic, if, if you think that your work is to come up with new ideas and to write papers and to have stimulating conversations, um, prepare you know, great, exciting lessons for your students, um, a lot of that stuff just disappears behind the meetings, the emails. And, and so I don't really love the word efficiency, um, but I'm kind of thinking, how do we make emails and meetings as efficient as possible so that they uh, take up as little time as possible so that we can free up more time to do the kinds of things that we, we really enjoy doing? So that's, I, 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 see, I see your output, Dave. And... You know, I just the blog, the the CPN, the the, the talks, um, the papers. You know, and I'm just fascinated by, you know, what it takes from your side to put out the volume of work that that you that you do. Is it, you know, do you have mad skills? Are you just lucky? Um, you know, like where does it come from? Because I I. Yeah, I mean, awe of of the uh, of the, the the quality and the, um, I guess the range of ideas as well, um, and I think the first time I came across it was when you I think it was the first CPN thirty days of September, and I think that you had put out a blog post every day over those thirty days, and I th I'm pretty sure it was all yours. Um, I, I don't remember seeing any other names in there. And uh, I remember thinking at the time, like, man, I, I can't put out, uh, you know, one a week with uh, any regularity. So anyway, I, I just thought it would be really nice to talk to you about some of the things that you do to, you know, as I say, capture that incoming information, you know, deciding what's useful, what do you keep, how do you come back to it? Um, you know, that thing that you captured that one time three years ago after that conversation, you know, Anyway, so that's what I was thinking when I said, do you want to, do you want to have a chat? And, um, yeah, ho hopefully you have all the answers. Well, I think this is a really interesting issue. And I think about how I am with this stuff. Um, they, there was a, I think it was in the 90s or the early 2000s. There was a, there was a whole thing about getting things done. Yes. CD, I think it had a, like a, you know, an abbreviation. It was a whole thing. Yeah, yeah. I read the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It sounded very kind of, um, I don't know, kind of capitalistic to me. Liking <laughs> the whole efficiency thing. I think there's something in that, you know, the 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 drive to be uber efficient all the time, to never stop. And yet, I find myself just trapped by it. Uh, you know, uh, not trapped by it because I love it. Um, 
I would think for every hour I spend doing something, I spend an hour organizing doing something. Um, but the interesting thing is that I've I found myself that it's made that time when I'm doing the thing much more enjoyable. So I think for me, I realized quite early on that I don't have a great memory. Um, I could train it. Uh, I remember trying to learn languages as a, as a kid at school and I just didn't have that kind of rote learning memory for stuff. I liked to know how things worked. And if I understood how things worked, that seemed to stick with me better. So I think quite early on, I developed ways to not to get around not trusting my memory. And I, so I think for a long time, I've tried to find workarounds and ways to make sure that I don't get stressed by remembering things. So, uh, I mean, a lot of people make lists. I'm a, I'm a huge list maker. I make lists of lists. Um, and I've got, I've got now some systems of making lists. So, for instance, I have a yellow pad. That's got my, got my stuff I've got to do this week on. And I use these little post-it notes like this for for like little notes of things I've got to do. Here's my here's my list of stuff I've got to do today. Um, and I'll, I'll just make lists. And in that way, I don't have to remember. I don't have to remember that today, for instance, I've got to go on to um, research elements and make sure that the article that went that was published a couple of weeks ago goes into research elements. And I, I could just hope that I remember that. Yes. But, so the second part of this is I get very stressed by that kind of memory, that, that uh, I've forgotten something. Yeah. I never liked that feeling. And I would rather feel relaxed and at peace and at ease than feel like that kind of urgency to remember stuff. Now, I know other people are different. Other people get really motivated by that i find for me that that blocks a lot of thinking so the the ultimate for me the point of doing all this for me is to make time for me to actually think about stuff now i don't know whether this is true from a psychological or biological point of view but i but it feels to me as if if i'm trying to remember things then it kind of sits in the front of my head and all i can think about is i've got to remember to do X, Y, and Z. I've got to remember. And it can be trivial stuff. I've got to remember that we're having pasta for dinner and I need to organize X, Y, and Z. And it sits there. Yeah. If that's sitting there, for me, I can't think. I can't, I can't think about that chapter of a book that I was reading the other day that now I want to think about and write about. So I simply have to have a system to get all of that stuff down. And if it's down and safe, I'm happy. Yeah. And now, um, I don't know. I mean, are you somebody who trusts their memory and can just hold it all in the head, or do you have to get it down? No. Are you no. So, like, it, what, when you were talking there, you were describing, you know, exactly the same thing uh, as me. Like, I have a terrible memory, and like, I at one point I would put things on the list, like have breakfast. Um, you know, just I realized I was getting a little bit of an endorphin hit by ticking things off of lists. And so it's it was this enormous kind of psychological feeling of safety of having been productive because at the end of the day, I can look at this list and I can say, man, look at all those things that I ticked off. And like obviously having have breakfast is you know a little bit of a joke, but the, the point is that I would sometimes go back and add things to the list that I'd already done just so that there was a record of me having done it. And I, I kind of thought like, you know, I, I felt like it was verging on pathology. Um, but the, the, whole, the whole idea of, of being very stressed by the idea that you might forget something um, really kind of resonates with me. And I think the, one of the big takeaways from the uh, getting things done um, philosophy, the idea of an inbox. And for me, the inbox is the place where you just dump the thing that you need to remember so that you don't have to take up any kind of cognitive space right now. So if I'm in the middle of giving feedback to a student and I remember that there's a phone call I need to make, 
it goes into the inbox and the inbox could be a pad that you keep next to you. It could be a Evernote note or, but it, it, the idea is that it's always in this one place and it's the one place that you know you're just going to dump things. And then I have uh, like, a, like as part of my reviews, I know that I need to go back and periodically check the inbox and then I just clear things out of the inbox, um, you know, according to priority or whatever. Um, so yeah, there, there's a lot that, that you were saying there that really kind of resonates with me. And, that has informed a lot of the way that I think about workflow. Um, is It's about clearing that mental space so that I know that, okay, I can spend three hours now reading or thinking or writing or whatever, because I know that I've got a plan for the rest of the day. And my plan for the rest of the day doesn't include an unreasonable number of items that I'm going to end the day with things that I don't have time to finish. That's really important to me. And, and once I started taking a more structured approach to thinking about what I'm going to do today and um, assigning realistic timeframes to tasks that you think might take an hour, but just once you start, not measuring, but once you start tracking how much time it actually takes to give feedback on a PhD chapter, like you know that it's going to take you two or three hours, not one hour. And so over time, when you've, when you have some experience of tracking things, you know that I've only got three things that I need to do today, but those three things are going to take the whole day. Um, that's a good day. I don't need to have 10 items to tick off the list. Um, but I've become a lot more strategic about how I put things into my list for the day and a lot more reasonable um, and realistic about what those things are and what I can actually achieve in, in the amount of time that I have. I guess we're talking primarily about academics here because I suppose if you're a clinician, if you're a student, and you've got a full-time clinical load today, we talk, that's a different kind of context. We're talking about people who are working in, primarily I am, about people who are working in an academic context. Now I've had, I think I've had every role you can have in a lecturing capacity over the last 30 years. I've been a jobbing lecturer, I've been a program leader, I've been a head of a physio program, I've been a researcher, I've been an associate professor and professor, I've done pretty much everything. And one of the things that I absolutely know is that academics have time. Now, there are various points in the year when things get really cramped, and if you've not organized yourself well, that can get really, really busy. But then there are other times in the year when it's not. Um, I've seen many, many, many clinicians, academics, sorry, who say to me, I just don't have time to do that. And, yeah. I, and I, I almost want to say, well, let's just open your diary. Because I'd like to bet that you've maybe got a dozen things this week that you actually have to commit to. And the rest of the time is your own. And yes, there are then a hundred things you've got to do. And some of those things are substantial. I mean, if you're reviewing a PhD thesis, it's three weeks of solid work. When are you going to do that? Because you've got to get that back in a month's time. And you know that three weeks of that is just taken up with reading that. But that will pass, and then there'll be some free time. And it's just the, how do you, how do you make the best use of that time? I would want to spend as much time as possible, for me, doing the things that are creative. The things I love the most are probably writing and creative writing around physiotherapy, thinking about physiotherapy. So the, the real kind of treat for me is to have the time to do that. So I think another thing that I think would be really important in what I, you might call a workflow for me is I always, always, always do the least enjoyable thing first. Get the least enjoyable thing done. Because if it, again, it's that thing about sitting in the front of your head. If it's sitting, you know, I'm going to do this writing, which I love doing, or I'm going to read that chapter, but I know I've got to get to my marking and I've four hours of marking to do today. It won't work. Do the marking. Get the jobs done that you need to do. Then look at that space. You might have the whole afternoon then to write or to read a chapter or two. So jam tomorrow is definitely, you know, kind of in my psyche all the time. Now you said about um, like an inbox. Um, I've got many academic colleagues, so I look at their email, you know, their 
notifications to the bottom and it'll be hundreds or thousands of it. I would be, a, you'd need to section me under the Mental Health Act if, if it was like that. I, I get anxious if my emails run past the page and they never do. Right now I've got two emails and both of those are just placeholders for things that are happening today. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think that, um, I don't know if you um, heard of Cal Newport. No. Um, he's, a, he's a computer science uh, lecturer, academic. He's got a, a podcast, a, a blog. He's written loads of books. Um, I find his way of thinking about, uh, for want of a better phrase, academic productivity to be very compelling. Um, and uh, um, yeah, you know, I mean, a lot of the kinds of things that you're talking about now are the, the same kinds of things that, that he mentions. Um, but I think, you know, the academic productivity thing is slightly a misnomer. And that's the capitalist stuff coming in, I think. Because in reality, a lot of us still in academia, things are changing quite a lot. And maybe um, it's not, in, not true everywhere. But a lot of us have the capacity and the scope to develop academic careers along the lines that draw our passions and interests. Um, we don't live in a totalitarian environment and academia is a place where, and certainly in something like physiotherapy, there's plenty of scope for innovation and creativity. So I think that one of the things that is, productivity will come if you're doing the things you love and that you're passionate about. And if it so happens that the things you're passionate about relate to your professional interest, which is primarily the reason you're in the job in the first place, and you can you can create time to do those things you love, the productivity will follow. It just comes. You can't help yourself, but you know, to be you know, wanting to share this stuff with the world. I think the the way that I think about it is that the I agree, like the, the that productivity will come if you're not completely overwhelmed with that kind of uh, incoming. There's just the, the constant requests for meetings and the constant emails. Just email etiquette in higher education is awful. Um, like the the, the um, carbon copy every, or reply everyone, uh, carbon copy to the whole department. Um, people use emails for everything uh, when a phone call would probably be a, a better option. We're just spammed. We're constantly spamming each other and we're constantly being spammed. Yes, but I would prefer to have an email that I can reply to when oh. ready. Going, talk to me, talk to me, talk to me, talk to me. At when trying to do something, you know, <laughs> go through my list and get my system. So no, no, no. I agree with you. When people phone me, I, I say, don't, uh, I can't deal with this now. Send me an email. Um, then once it's, in, once it's in an email, then it's in my system. And, and then I can deal with it. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess the, the point about the email was just to, uh, you know, to open your email in the morning and have 50 emails sitting there, 40 of which don't have anything to do with you. They've been, you've been CC'd in, you know, FYI. Like, don't CC me into your, like, conversation that I didn't care about. Um, anyway, it, it, it just creates that cognitive load that, like, now, yes, it only takes a second for me to archive that email. But now I've got to trawl through those emails. I've got to read them. Does this actually, uh, you know, refer to something that I need to deal with? Um, and it, I, I mentioned Cal Newport. He's just published a new book called The World Without Email, um, which, which I think is, is quite interesting. So when you've got the emails coming in then and you want to keep something, you want to hold it, but you don't want to deal with it right now, where yeah. does it go? I snooze it. So it stays in email. Yeah, I do, uh, my university uses Gmail for the back end. So Gmail has a feature called snooze. So you say, take this away and bring it back in two weeks. Um, so it disappears out of your inbox and it goes into, a, it's just, it's a separate uh, label that it gives um, called snooze. It goes into a different folder and then after a time period, it comes back. Um, before that, um, it, it was a little bit more challenging. Um, what I tend to do is I, uh, I tend to move information out of email as soon as possible, especially if it's a task. So um, a lot of people don't realize this, but uh, many years ago, that one of the Gmail engineers said that an, an email inbox is inherently chaotic and it's um, created by other people for work that is important to them. 
Um, you know, there, there's nothing coming into your email that is, there's very few things coming into your inbox that are good for you. There are always demands on your time that are going to help other people. Um, and if, if you think of your email inbox as a to-do list, um, I think it makes a lot more sense. Um, and I, I, for me, dealing with my inbox as a to-do list is very useful. And so if there's information that I need to capture, I pull it out of email as soon as possible. It goes into my system, I archive the email. If it's a task that needs to be done, I extract it from the email and archive the email. Uh, the whole point of, I try to finish every day with an empty inbox. And that sometimes that just means I've snoozed the email until tomorrow. But it means that I go home feeling free. Um, I, I know that there isn't something sitting there waiting for me, uh, which for, for me is is great. I know other people, you know, they sit there with 4,000 emails in their inbox. And I think, how can you live like this? You must have, like everyone else, you know, the world is, is an interesting place. And there's a lot of things going on and a lot of conversations that are interesting, a lot of ideas that are interesting. So how do you deal with that incoming? There's, there's just this onslaught, if you don't pay attention, um, that can be overwhelming. And I have this tendency to feel like I need to read everything that comes in or, or at least look at it to make sure there's nothing interesting there, um, which uh, doesn't always work out well. How do you kind of deal with incoming? Um, you know, what, what, do you, what do you use to filter out the noise? Um, how, do you, how are you more comfortable or more confident knowing that you're paying attention to the signal that you're interested in? Uh, what do you capture that stuff in? Um, how do you return to it? Uh, you know, th those kinds of things. Um, well, interesting you saying about the emails. What I do, I don't have a, I, I think there probably is a snooze capacity, but on my uh, Apple Mail program, but I don't use it. I use Evernote. And this is by, you know, by way of kind of, declaration i am not funded by evernote or any of the you know the prime that this is not product placement none of these people support any of the work that i do this is just my own stuff that you know i personally used um i've been using evernote now for about six or seven years and i've really liked it i'm not so keen on some of the changes they've made to it recently but it's basically if you don't know it it's a tool that captures anything and everything um so it can capture emails, you can find web pages you like and, and put them on there. It can do audio files and videos. It's basically just like your brain. The logo for Evernote is an elephant. And it's, it's like that part of my brain that I don't trust. Yet. Anything I want to remember goes into Evernote and it can capture, I think, pretty much anything. I read an article that goes to Evernote. I think of a web page that I want to go and see and it goes to Evernote. And the other thing that I've really loved about Evernote in the past is that it has a fantastic search capacity. So yeah. you can put tags on the files that you make. It's like a massive filing cabinet, really, of everything. But you don't really need to because the um, the search capacity is so amazing on the, on the software that it will even find... I'm writing notes as we're talking here, you see, to remember about this stuff. It'll even find handwritten notes on things that you capture. So I've got handwritten notes that I photograph and then send to Evernote. And it's very quick and easy to send them. There's a web browser button and there's a various... You just send it to Evernote, your Evernote address, and it puts it in there. And then it just goes into Evernote. If I want... If it's something I've got to do something with, I'll just a tag, a, attach a tag to it, which I email or wherever, which is just a dot one tag. And the numbering system in there means that it goes to the front. And I've got a folder of dot one stuff, which is stuff I've got to do. So somebody sends me an email and they say, can you read this? And I can't do it right then. I'll send it to Evernote. And it just goes into that little folder, which has got maybe 20 or 30 things in, which is my jobs that I've got to remember to do. I find a, an article on the web that I want to read. I send it there. And so it's just one place where everything goes. And then once a week, usually um, on a Friday or a Saturday morning or sometime like that, sort of at the end of the week before, I'll go through the Evernote file, I'll go through my diary, and I'll just make a list of all the things from that file I've got to do this week. 
And so that's the place where the jobs sit. And then I can make my notes on my yellow paper to say, okay, so this is this week's jobs. And I've got yeah. things that are going to be big jobs. Um, right now, for instance, as an example, um, I nearly finished the final proofs of the new book that I've written and I'm putting the index together and the index is taking an age as it always does. It's a big job. So that goes onto this sheet of paper in a big box. And then little jobs like call this person are just lists down the side. And that way I never feel really like I'm going to forget anything. And that I think is part of that getting things done about the productivity business. Um, it would be very rare, it would be very unusual for me to forget a meeting or to forget to send something to somebody. Even things where I've said, for instance, a couple of weeks ago, I had a three-week block of really heavy marking. And I said to a lot of, quite a number of people, I can't deal with this right now. Can I call you back when the marking's done? So I'd send, put a note in Evernote to go, call Michael back after marking. And then come that Friday afternoon or Saturday morning, I'd run down the list and I'd remember, I've got to call Michael, it goes on the list, and then I make sure it gets done. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, it, once everything is in its place, then you can you can relax. So so you capture you capture everything in Evernote, and now you make the phone call. Do you delete that line in Evernote or delete that note, or does it get archived? If it's uh, just a call somebody, it just would be deleted. If it's something to read, I might keep the file. I just take the tag away, the kind of dot one do it tag, and it just goes into the Evernote cloud. And I can find it again later. I can find that article written by such and such because the search function is so cool. When you say an article, do you mean like a blog post, newspaper article, a PDF of a research paper? Does it all go into Evernote? All goes into Evernote. Yo. I don't, I don't know if I could deal with that. Um, I, I think I have to have um, a clearer delineation between uh, kind of what I think of as, I guess, operational stuff, which is keeping track of meetings, projects, tasks, and reading stuff. Um, so I, I would have to keep those things just in my head. I keep them separate. Um, One of the things that um, occupies a lot of our time as academics these days I think is reading um, web material um, now one of the questions is how do you capture that uh, and for me I'm a big fan of RSS readers so I used to be a fan of Feedly but in, in the last couple of months I've, I've moved to a, a different RSS reader called Inno Reader which is fabulous you I made the switch about two years ago from Feedly to Inno Reader um, it, it's brilliant, especially if you're on the free tier. Uh, you get a lot more features and, uh, and uh, I guess, capabilities on the free version of, of InnoReader. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, people might not use RSS readers, but, but essentially you can tell, you can put the web address for a website, uh, a journal, for instance, um, the physiotherapy journal you can put the web address in and anytime a new article comes up onto into the journal's current issue it sends a message to inner reader and so what you do when you open inner reader in a morning for me <coughs> is you get a list of I don't know sometimes 50 sometimes 100 sometimes more things that might have come from social media or from um, uh, academic sources or web pages or news sites or wherever it is or sport whatever it is and it's there as like a magazine of a list of, of, of items. Now I'll go through that and then, as you know, within a reader, you can swipe and star them. And then those starred ones are ones that when you clear that list off and say, I've read all of those, they're retained. And then that's when I'll make time during every day to go in and read those things. And a lot of those things that I read will end up on the CPN Digest on Friday. Uh, they'll get if I, I read through them and think, yeah, we could. That's interesting. That could be useful. That would go into the digest. Okay. So now we're getting to the nitty gritty. So, so now you've read it and you've decided this is useful. I'm assuming if 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 you read it and you think oh, interesting, move on. You just unstar it and and we're good. Um, if if now you've read it, um, you think this is great. I want to share this with somebody. 
Now, you could share it in an email, you could share it as a tweet, you could put it into a digest that's gonna go out in a newsletter, you could share it as a blog post. It may have a sentence or two that you think is useful for a paper that you're writing. Where does it go from in a reader? Does it all just go into Evernote with a little tag that says, okay, so where do we go from in a reader? So if it's something I think, oh, Michael would be really interested in that, I'll just email you. Or sometimes, sometimes if, if we're connected, say, through Facebook or Twitter, it'll be that way. Just a direct message. Yes. If it's something I'm going to write about or I want to think about for writing, then, well, put that, let's put a pin in that for a second. If it's something I just want to hold and keep, but I don't necessarily need to read right now, but I think I might do. So, for instance, for oh, probably four or five years now, anything that anybody's <laughs> written, the names of a couple of key authors in, um, they're quite obscure, but I want to see what all the stuff that's in them. I just send it to Evernote, and I've got a folder, I've got a tag with their name on it. I just put it onto the message sends it to Evernote, it just goes dumped in that folder, and then at some point later on I can go in and go, right, this is everything that people have been writing about Bill Smith, that's not in that. Just dump it in there, because I'm not yeah. dealing with it now, but I want to hold it. I don't keep it in in, in a reader, because I want to keep that clean, because that's my ink feed, like email. Absolutely. So that's dumped in there. If I want to write about it, or it's something I want to write notes about, then um, I've got two things I would do with it. The first one is you want to keep it, keep it electronically because then you can find it and you can use it to write with. So I use a program called Ulysses to write. And Ulysses is, um, is writes in what's called Markdown script, which is the most stripped back form of writing you can do. But it works on the same kind of folder and file system. And I've written this new book using Ulysses and I love Ulysses as a writing tool. So I'll create a little file for that article and put it in there and it will be as part of something I'm going to write about. So this is going to be writing about how physiotherapists change the world for the better and now the world loves everything. And there's that folder. And I know when I come back to write that section in wherever the chapter or the article is going to be, there it is with the material in it. And it's it can be some cases just um, f coming to find 20 pieces that were selected over the last two years that you'd forgotten about. Like, the therapy changed the world for the better. Think about it, but it's there. If I want to do some really deep thinking about it and I want to um, study it, then I have to, I found I have to do that by hand. So I keep um, a handwritten journal. And so if I'm going through a book in a really detailed way, you know, line by line editing or commenting or thinking, I do it in a laborious way and I find by handwriting notes and quotes and ideas down in a journal is the best way for me to actually process ideas. After about two or three weeks of going, if I'm look, going through a book for instance, if, after about a couple of weeks of going through a book in a really intense way, I might have 30 or 40 pages of handwritten notes. And then I've found that I'm starting to get a bit lost in the woods, there's so many ideas and I need to kind of visualize and see it. So often at that point, I'll turn a page in the journal and do a mind map. I'll go back over the last three weeks of notes and read them all again and just mind map on this page where everything is and what the ideas were and remind myself of what this stuff was. And then put the page numbers by the sides of the thing itself and see how many pages are referring to that thing. And then I've got it in front of me. I remember um, when I started doing my PhD, I really didn't know anything at all about Michel Foucault and Foucault's writing. And um, I did that. I got some of the readers, the kind of introductions to Foucault, and started writing ideas down. And after about two or three weeks, mind mapped them. I ended up, after the first year, with this enormous A3 sheet of yellow card with this crazy mind map all over of Foucault's ideas and I would sometimes put little icons on the on the book itself and draw pictures like uh, doodles every time this idea came up just as a kind of visual cue and that went on the mind map as well I can still tell you where the word biopower appears on that 
football on that mm -hmm. technologies of discipline are and if ever I wanted to go back and get a sense of what that idea really was about I'd look at that yellow sheet that yellow card I'd see technologies of discipline it was in journal one page 35 42 47 48 49 I'd go back to journal page 47 read that again okay now I know what I'm talking and thinking about and it was amazing uh, how quickly um, it got to the point where I felt comfortable with those ideas that I knew nothing about beforehand. I think, I mean, you've, you've talked about quite a few things that I've made, made notes on. Um, I think, first of all, just to kind of go back to the idea of Ulysses, um, Mac only. So uh, that's a, a, bit of a, a bit of a road bump. Um, the closest thing that I found to Ulysses, uh, first of all, I'm the same, uh, I write in Markdown almost exclusively, except when I need to do some collaborative work and, and we're going to be using Google Docs or something like that. Um, Markdown is, in case people don't know. Um, it, it allows you to write in plain text, which means you are not limited to writing in Word, um, which means you can write on any device. Uh, plain text is one of those things that, uh, like your toaster, can understand what plain text is. So you're not um, stuck um, in, a, uh, in a specific format. So one of the problems that I had with Evernote is that um, I wanted to be able to access my notes across too many more devices than the free version of Evernote would allow. So I switched to an open source tool called Joplin, which as far as I can tell, does everything that Evernote can do except for the, um, the optical character recognition for handwriting to, to text. Um, but so I use Joplin for, for that kind of capturing in a similar way that you do, except I move things to different uh, um, services depending on what I'm going to do with them. So I would read everything in a service called Pocket, um, whereas it sounds like you would do most of your reading in Evernote. Um, for things that I want to keep, I keep in a library, which for me is Zotero, which is a, an open source um, article slash PDF slash resource manager. Um, so everything that I want to keep in the long term, um, you know, it, it, it should be something that I've read or at least something that I know is going to have some long term value. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't become a repository for everything that I've ever read. Um, and then in Zotero is where I try to do that kind of deep reading that you uh, have talked about. Well, I'll do I'll do a lot of kinds of reading in Zotero and it, it allows you to mark up your PDFs or your um, web pages. Uh, you can make notes and tags and, and all that sort of thing. But I, I've also found that to really get to grips with difficult ideas, there's something about sitting down with a hard copy and, and working in pen or pencil that uh, it, it gets it into my brain in a different way um, than highlighting and making notes um, in, a, in a digital format. Then once I've worked with it in, in hard copy, I'll go back and I'll I'll rewrite those um, those notes. Um, I don't really use mind mapping. Um, I, that hasn't really been useful for me. Um, but it, lately, I've been using a tool called Obsidian just to try and link ideas, um, which which I have found very useful. And it, it sounds like you maybe get a, a similar um, effect on your memory um, by using the mind mapping. Yeah, and I think this is a really important point for me, which is that um, you have to be really, really strict about not being trapped by the rush of knowledge and information. Pretty, I've pretty, I've been pretty strict myself about not really getting that immersed in social media. Um, I've got friends and colleagues who, it seems to me, don't spend an hour without actually going on and writing something up. And it's sometimes really interesting academic stuff. But I think about what they, their days must be like, how frantic and fraught they must be, just bouncing like a pinball between all these ideas. I think the real um, juice of our, our academic work is the slow scholarship. The, the, the slowness is really important. And I think partly going through a book um, and reading a book slowly and annotating it in notes is partly an act of slowing down and actually not just capturing stuff to disseminate it to other people, to give them the impression that you're thinking of a lot of stuff, actually engage in something. 
um, to to really deeply think it through needs time and needs a slowness that means that you have to manage all the other chaos of life yeah and i think part of this workflow stuff is about creating having systems that are robust enough for you so that you have that time um i would think myself that it's a bad week if i can't spend at least a third of my time in that slow thinking so you know we're talking about in excess of 20 hours a week just with a book and handwritten notes and quietly thinking now i i, I agree with that um i i try to i try to put aside two hours a day um for for writing reading thinking and i i try to be very protective about that time so i won't take meetings from anyone uh, if anyone asks for a meeting even if the dean of the faculty asks for a meeting I'm not available in in that time period that's my time for writing and i think that's a reasonable position to take when you consider that a significant part of your job as an academic is to write to think to come up with new ideas now i'm not always able to stick to that schedule sometimes like if if you know if i've got a phd student who's trying to get ready to submit you know we're focused on other priorities um, if exams are over and we're marking then you know my writing isn't a priority um, but I, I've tried to block out that time so that that's my default. I think most people will try to, most people's default is a full day of just responding, just reacting. And I try to make my default have two hours of protected time every day. And as I say, sometimes it's just life is too chaotic and, and that default gets wiped out. But the default is that writing is important and it's and it's a part of the day um so I, I don't know if i can get as much time as well i know that i don't get as much time as i would like um but i think that's been especially valuable um to to start with the premise that a big part of my job is being an author and i i need to set aside time to write because if you wait for time you're never going to have the time yeah, I think the time is, is crucial and freeing up that time is really important. I, one of the, the most valuable things I ever did when I was in the early stages of my PhD, uh, very early on, which was 2004. So at the time I had a young family. I think uh, my kids would have been early teens, two of them. Um, Sue, my wife, she was working. So we had a busy house and I had a busy job as a, as a lecturer, um, full teaching load, lots of kind of career you know career work to be done lots of admin work at the university and i wanted desperately to do this phd but really thought well where am i going to find the time in the day as most people do and i decided then um that i would get up at 5 a.m every day well six days a week and i would do two hours of work now for some people who are night birds that would be just murder i'm actually an early morning person i'm um I love the early mornings and I found it incredible because I'd slept so my head was clear it was a time when the house was quiet um, nobody was about um, and for two hours it was just this blissful kind of slow reading thinking lots of journaling um, lots of mind mapping and ideas forming and because of the nature of the PhD I did, which was theoretical, I didn't need a lab, I didn't need to access, Not. you know, two weeks to interview patients. I could gradually work through it. And I, so six days a week, two hours a day, I added 12 hours a week to work on my PhD. And then, of course, by seven o'clock in the morning, the kids were waking up and I could start my day knowing that I could concentrate on my teaching job and get home and spend time right. with the family and not be mithered by thinking I've got to put two hours tonight to the one I don't want to and I'm tired and you know at the end of the day I I find my I'm kind of mentally tired I can't I don't have any much creative space and so much of the work in academia is about creativity and thinking so it was blissful for me and still to this day I get up at five o'clock every day so Saturday and Sunday too and although now I've flipped it a little bit because I like to think in the morning that I like to get all of the other stuff out of the way, frees up time to then think and write. 
it's still I would still advocate that for anybody who can physically do it as a way to find time because otherwise you won't find the time yeah yeah that's interesting um, when I first met my wife I was about halfway through my PhD and the first time we went out I said to her, look I'm, I'm busy with this thing it's it's quite a big deal to me um, and you need to know that um, for the next two years at least um, I'm gonna be busy with this six nights a week um, and you know that's just the way that it is and if if that's a deal breaker then you know you need to know that now um, and and that was it like I I, I didn't do two hours every night um, but I was doing one my first wife yes <laughs> and then after two years <laughs> But, but you're right, you have to carve out that time um, and it has to be protected time. Um, and I've, I've now switched. Um, I get up at five o'clock now and I do, I do an hour and a half or two hours before the kids get up. Um, and I also, th that time for me is, is the best time. Um, and, and I like it most when I don't have anything that I feel like I have to do um, because then it becomes almost playful. Um, and so that time becomes, you know, wherever you happen to be taken. And there's always a list of something to read because of this inbox. So I can go to the inbox and I can see what, you know, what strikes my fancy today. Um, but haven't you found, I mean, this is where the internet's kind of messed with this a bit. Because back in 2004, 2005, 6, 7, 8, when I was doing my PhD, there wasn't video conferencing. Just Skype was patchy at best. The internet wasn't that great. I've found since we've had video conferencing and Zoom and Skype and things like that, that um, between five and seven in the morning now, invariably I'll have a couple of meetings with people overseas. And because I'm in New Zealand and, you know, in America are 12 or so many hours apart, it's a good time. Um, yes. Well, I mean, you know, you can see, you can see what, uh, you know, my lighting is like. Um, it's nighttime here. And, you know, for me, I also, at the end of the day, I'm, you know, you know, I give, I give my good, you know, eight to 10 hours. And after that, I'm, I'm done. Like, I don't, I don't want to deal with work. Luckily, this is not work. Um, but the, the idea of trying to have uh, like a faculty meeting or, or a meeting with uh, like a research collaborator to talk about a grant application, trying to do that kind of thing now uh, would, would be very difficult for me. I, I find you have to know yourself well enough to realize when is your creative time? When is the, when is the time that you're going to have your best ideas, uh, do your most kind of uh, interesting writing? Um, even if you just get out a sentence in, in that hour, um, you know, it, it, it's a good sentence. Um, but if you don't know when is your good time, then you are kind of, you know, what is it, buffeted by the winds of change or something. You're constantly having to react to what I think of as incoming. There's just this constant stream of things coming for your attention. And if you don't have the self-knowledge to know, look, from 8 to 10 in the morning, that's when I do my best writing, then 8 to 10 is always going to be taken up with someone else's demands on your time and attention. Um, and so a lot of the systems that I have are about trying to trying to protect that time that I know is is good time for, for me to do the work that I'm most interested um, in doing. Um, I just had one, one last thing that I, I wanted to ask you. We got up to the point where you are using Ulysses to, to do your writing in Markdown. And after this, uh, you know, um, you, you're not, uh, I know that you can publish straight to WordPress from Ulysses. Um, but let's say you're writing a paper and it's not a collaborative paper, so it's it's just your own words. You don't have to deal with, um, you know, Google Docs or something. Where does it go from from Ulysses? Are you copying and pasting into Word? Uh, what 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 is the step from Ulysses to out into the world? So, um, I mean, if you take an example of the book, which is, I suppose, a, it could, it's a composite of nine article-sized pieces or, or thereabouts. It's the same principle applies to articles. Um, I write everything, format everything in Ulysses. So in Ulysses, for instance, you know, when you put headings into Word, this is a main title heading and then there's a subheading. You can do it with asterisks. Everything's formatted. Um, images that come in, tables, they're all part of it. It's all done in Ulysses. And um, at, only at the point when it's ready to go do I click to send it to Word. 
and then with Ulysses you can tell it to style the word document in many ways styles the word document and usually that's it um, and it's then sent out to a journal or to another person or whomever so it's all done right up to the last minute in Ulysses and do you do you keep all your writing in one place because I, I know a lot of people would write their draft blog post in WordPress uh, they'd have articles in Google Docs some articles would be in uh, in a folder in Word uh, some might be in scraps of paper um, what, what do you think is the best thing about keeping all of your writing in the one place um, well I suppose it's not entirely true because other people might have other ways of doing things and so um, you and Jay and I have been um, write, co-writing co co um, on a couple of papers and we've had to find a way to actually work collaboratively. Um, you talked about us trying to use Obsidian the last time we talked. Um, I'd used Google um, Slides with colleagues before when we're trying to map out an article put to do it almost like a PowerPoint with this comes before this comes before this sometimes you have to break your own you know to move out of your own personal system but if I'm if after that meeting I'm gonna go away and write something we need 500 words on this I'll do it in Ulysses and write it there the advantage of having it all in the one place is that all my writing is in there and if I ever think, okay, so where was that thing I was writing with Michael and Jay? Oh, well, you know, I know it's in Ulysses, so I can just go and find it. I don't have to think, oh, did I put it in that Word folder or was it on Google? It'll all, it'll be there. Yeah, nice. Cool, Dave, um, I'm conscious of the time. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, is there anything else, any other tips that you think might be useful for me to uh, think about? No, I, I, I would go back to the point I was saying at the start. I think um, I find it a huge relief to know that I don't have half a dozen things that are in the ether out there that somebody wants me to do or I should be doing or is sitting there undone, which means that that frees me up mentally to do the things that I love um, and that really give me a lot of pleasure and joy. And I think that might not be the case for everybody. Other people might have different ways of doing things, but that's how it works for me. Cool. Thanks, Dave. I think that's a great place to end. I uh, really appreciate it. Keep well.